Our sun may be quiet, but the space weather continues to delight and amaze with a meteor explosion and a solar eclipse. Those stories and more in the news this week. This forecast, sponsored in part by Eric Johansson. Check him out at Instagram.com slash Scoobist. Space weather from our sleepy star continues to be quiet this week. As we switch to our front side sun, it's a similar story as last week. We do have a couple remnant coronal holes that are going to be giving us some fast solar wind, more like disturbed solar wind because they're not going to cause much of a ruckus. The only interesting thing is that we have had a couple emergences of small active regions, but you know, as soon as they come up, they disappear. And this is kind of a good reminder that we are at the very end of solar cycle 24, before before solar cycle 25 begins. The good news is as we switch to our backside sun, you can see those old bright regions, remnants 2740 and 2741 from, uh, geez, a couple rotations ago, they are still existing. And as they rotate into earth view, they will give the solar flux just a small boost. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, I know you've been starving with some very low radio propagation, and it looks like you're gonna get a boost here in the next maybe three to five days. Last week it was news of a meteor crater on the red planet. This week it's a meteor exploding in the atmosphere of our own planet. On June 22nd at 2125 UTC, a large meteor broke apart and exploded in the skies just 300 kilometers south of Puerto Rico. Captured by the geostationary lightning mapper GLM on the GO-16 satellite, this explosion lit the skies quite vividly, but it was still daylight in Puerto Rico so there have been no eyewitness accounts. Still, the meteor was observed by several instruments, including the Advanced Baseline Imager, ABI, which caught the meteor track in multiple bandwidths. The split paths of the meteor track you see here verify the meteor broke apart during its descent. Acoustic data from the Infrasound Array, CTBTO, determined that the explosive power of this bolide was equivalent to a 3 to 5 kiloton detonation. That's about a tenth of the size of the bolide that exploded over the skies in Russia back in 2013. Yet the bolide was quite sizable, estimated to be about 3 meters in diameter. Indeed, this meteor was large enough to be observed as an asteroid prior to entering Earth's atmosphere. It was given an official designation, 2019 MO, because it fit the orbit of a near-Earth object identified as A10EO-M1. This kind of early identification of an incoming meteor is revolutionary. It has only happened four times in our history, and it demonstrates our improving ability for early detection of these kind of space weather threats. But until we get to a point where we can predict all large meteor impacts, we can be grateful that we have a thicker atmosphere at our planet than at Mars. To put things in perspective, this meteor was nearly the same size as the meteor that caused the new impact crater on Mars. If we didn't have the atmosphere we have at Earth, this bolide would surely have hit the ground. And this fact should give us all something to think about as we become more spacefaring with tangible plans to colonize other worlds. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the new moon phase, with the new moon being on the 2nd of July, along with a total solar eclipse. This eclipse is going to be seen all across the South Pacific, with at least a partial eclipse visible from the Polynesian Islands all the way to Chile and Argentina. So if you are in those regions, definitely be prepared on the 2nd. You should be in for a fantastic show. And speaking of the eclipse, my colleagues at Predictive Science have finalized their prediction for what the sun's corona is going to look like during totality on July 2nd. Here is a view of their model output that shows all of the detail and fine structure that will go into the corona to make it what it looks like on July 2nd. And here is what the view will be on the ground for people looking up after the corona has been smeared out through our own atmosphere. So you field reporters, be sure to take pictures if you're down there and you catch totality so we can compare and see how well they did. 
Switching to our solar storm and aurora possibilities over the coming week. We are anticipating the small pockets of fast solar wind, but you know, any more, that fast solar wind isn't all that fast. So we're not expecting much more than just slight disturbances. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting unsettled conditions with up to about a 25% chance of a minor storm. Now at mid latitudes, well, we're expecting normal to unsettled conditions with up to about a 15% chance of active conditions, but don't get your hopes up. This is really not gonna last all that long and it will probably continue like this over the next couple days before things begin to settle down and go back to quiet. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green when it comes to big solar flares. We have a teeny tiny little sunspot that is actually rotating off of the sun's west limb right now, and it's sure not doing anything to boost that solar flux. So GPS users, you should be very happy. On Earth's day side, we have no risk for radio blackouts, and we don't even have much in the way of solar flux to cause any issues for you at low latitudes. But amateur radio and emergency responders and shortwave responders, well, this is what field day look like for you, and I know that's pretty dismal. Luckily, we do have a couple bright regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view here in the next few days, and they could boost this solar flux up to the low end of marginal, and that should give you just a little bit of a reprieve. Not sure how much, but we're going to keep our fingers crossed. Now, also, because we are at solar minimum, the cosmic ray flux is penetrating much more intensely than it normally would, so you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew who fly over 800 hours annually, and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes, you are in the marginal range for radiation dose, and this does include prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So our sun may be quiet, but this is an exciting week in space weather. We have a total solar eclipse that's going to happen on July 2nd, and the path of totality is going to pass over Chile and Argentina. So if you're a field reporter anywhere in those regions, it's a great time to be looking up at the skies. Now, on top of that, we had a massive kiloton, multi-kiloton explosion of a meteor just a few hundred kilometers south of Puerto Rico. And this was so unique because we were able to track this particular meteor when it was an asteroid prior to it entering. And that's only happened a few times in our history. That tells us that our space weather field reporting is getting better and better. Now, returning to the sun, well, we've got a spotless sun right now, and I know radio propagation is pretty dismal. It was a pretty dismal field day for amateur and emergency responders and shortwave radio responders. I'm sorry for that, guys, but hopefully things are going to get a little bit better. We do have some bright regions that are rotating back into Earth view, and they'll be boosting the solar flux here probably in the next three to five days. Maybe we'll get back into the marginal range for radio propagation, so keep your fingers crossed. Now, you GPS users, well, you know, reception should look pretty good for you all the way around the globe. The only thing is that if you happen to be in the path of totality uh, during the eclipse, you might get a few glitches here and there, as well as some radio propagation issues as that shadow of the moon passes right over you. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching.